I'm Jim. And I'm David. And this is the Practical Guitarist Podcast. The podcast for people who eat, sleep, and breathe guitar. It's contest time again. Great Lakes Guitar Pickups is giving away another set of pickups, and this time it's a Strat set for one of you lucky listeners. To enter, record a video telling us about why you deserve the pickups and send it to questions at practicalguitars.com. We'll review the video and confirm your entry in the drawing. Don't stress, use your cell phone or 90s era webcam if that's all you've got. Get your submissions in by April 20th, 2019, because we'll hold the drawing live in our Facebook group on April 21st. And remember, if you've already won, don't bother entering again as you are no longer eligible to win. Are you a regular listener? Why not? Subscribe using your chosen podcast app. Review us on iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or Google Play. Find our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash practical guitarist or locate us on Twitter as at practguitarist. Support the show. Merchandise is available in our Threadless store at practicalguitarspodcast.threadless.com or you can donate to us via Patreon, which is available at patreon.com slash practicalguitarist. If you'd like to reach out to us directly, you can do so via email at questions at practicalguitarist.com. Hey, everybody. I'm Jim. I'm David. And David is not doing well. I have Montezuma's Revenge by way of Texas. Oh, my gosh. I spent the majority of the afternoon uh, not feeling well on uh, on my bed here. I was supposed to work until 7 tonight. I only worked till 4.30. Were you playing the Game of Thrones? <laughs> Uh-oh. Blood Throne involved, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, just to let everybody know, David is on a Skype connection from uh, Dallas. Yeah, we're, and... we're, tr- we're trying real hard to make this episode happen, folks. Yeah. So he may cut out. And I'll, if I ask him to repeat, it's because of that. And, so, and Jim can just talk away. He's got a lot of topics tonight. So. This is that one time where I get to say more than David. All right, so this week we're going to start with, um, with number one is extended chords. Love them or hate them? So the way the reason this came up is because obviously I'm doing that police song right in the in the band and it's like right good lord it and, wouldn't be so bad add nines everywhere yeah it wouldn't be so bad if the add nine was there but it's add nine add nine add nine add nine okay slide in add nine add nine add nine add nine slide yeah. in add nine add nine add nine, add nine. <laughs> I wish you were kidding I know and I'm not. So the the song, just to put that in perspective, the song is, um, uh, oh, geez, Message in a Bottle. And uh, it just moves way too fast, way too fast. Um, So I was looking at more extended chords because I'm like, okay, uh, who else uses extended chords? Well, obviously, another chord extension that everybody just about uses is the Hendrix chord. Right, E7 uh, E7 sharp nine or whatever. Right. And that's a that's an um, extension that, uh, believe it or not, came from the Beatles. Beatles used yeah, it first. Yeah. Well, they didn't use it first. Well, I'm sure they invented it. But it's really close harmonic. I would say it's very close harmonically to a half diminished. Yeah. Yeah. So, you cut out a bit there, uh, but I did hear you say it's harmonically close to a half diminished. Yeah, that I, I repeated myself. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, this is going to be a little sticky, guys, and and we hope we're going to keep this to an hour today, this week. We hope that uh, that's all right, but we've got to kind of make this work for us. Um, so, as far as the extended chord, I like extended chords. I think they're interesting. I think harmonically they work within most songs. But what are you, what are your thoughts? Just be careful. Don't overuse them, especially if you're writing music. Um, it can be a challenge to find players who can deal with all the extended chords. Um, something I've run into before. Um, I used to overuse them a lot. I mean, throw your minor sevenths and your major sevenths and your dominant sevenths in, but just be careful about 9, 11, 13s, things like that. I use 13s all the time. The players I play with can figure it out. Um, but, you know, just using like... 
Yeah, I think the the hardest part can be when you're trying to solo over them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it, a lot of times it's no different than whatever it's either it's a dominant major minor seven. Like you can pretty much figure it out from there. But if you're not comfortable with it in the ear, you may not be able to pick out the right uh, scales and stuff. So yeah, exactly. So <clears throat> we're we're gonna discuss something because we've got we've got political um, implications of things that are going on right now. And all, while we're not gonna talk about the politics of them. <laughs> We do, we do want to go into some of these things. So we're going to start out with American-made versus building, Ameri- building in America with overseas parts versus building overseas with American-made parts. And uh, we want to talk about that. So um, when, you, when you're when you looking at, at guitars, right? I mean, I don't think there is actually a single guitar where all the parts are actually made in the United States with the exception of certain boutique custom builders um, because you're going to find bridges, um, uh, electronic parts, you know, these things are built overseas. So you do bring parts in overseas from overseas to build American made guitars, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so what is truly made in America anymore? We don't make People. our own, yeah. We don't make our own steel. We don't make our own um, uh, a lot of our own electronic components. Drugs. Yeah, drugs. <laughs> drugs. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Grown right in our backyard. Yeah, we we create foul politicians and stuff like that too. But um, for my fellow South Park fans, integrity, integrity is built in America. Well, so. When you break something down to its component parts, right? Mm-hmm. You like say, where does the wire come from? Where do the magnets come from? Where do right. I, you know what I'm saying? Like you break it down to its composite parts, the plastic, yep, like the bobbins and all that stuff, right? It's, at least some of that's important. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> that said, so we talk about uh, different things, and then there's there's um, stuff where the United States builds parts, then they ship some parts overseas and then things are assembled overseas so uh, well or or down to mexico like in the case of fender right where they send stuff from corona down to mexico which is only 40 miles away but the problem is now we have a we have a wall well we're gonna have a wall or we may have a wall and we do have we're gonna have a, at least a theoretical law uh, wall right we're gonna have a, a monetary wall if things go one way or another um, and again, we're not getting into the politics of it, um, but it does affect us price-wise. We've already seen price jumps in stuff coming from Asia, right? And uh, so it, it's only a matter of time before not only will you not be able to get guacamole, but you won't be able to get a, a Fender Strat from, from this. No, but uh, uh, go ahead, Dave. You've got, I'm sure you've got some, uh, David, you've got some input. Well, if I can not cut out here. Yes. Um, I, so I've always wondered if that's even true, that they're shipping parts down to Mexico for production, like, and how much of that's true. Yeah. We know at some point they were doing some of that. Right. But I mean, would it be cost effective for them to keep shipping stuff over the border? I, I'm not sure. Do they, I, I wonder if they ship like components. I, I know that in the beginning they were just shipping bodies and necks. Um, and, a, and components, yeah. and then they were doing the assembling and finishing, um, and, and I'm not, but that was all part of, of while they were gearing them up, right? And the Squire line started in in uh, Mexico. The the Fender Custom Shop used to buy parts from both Godin and uh, uh, Carvin, which is now Kiesel. Right. I mean that's that's been well talked about over the years. Yeah. Um, Um, the Godin one is actually kind of surprising to me because obviously they're funneling parts in from Canada. Right. Uh, and they were putting them into custom shop level guitars. Yeah. yeah. So point is, I mean, it, maybe in the beginning when they didn't have all the production in line, but now they've been doing this long enough with the, with the uh, Mexican production that, I mean, 
there's really no reason for them to be doing a import export situation mm-hmm. other than to you know bring completed guitars in right right um so I guess what I'm and what I'm getting at is there's a lot more the the, the difference between the American made regardless of what company you're talking about Gibson uh, Fender um, you know Schecter uh, whatever it, it, the the difference in the ones that are made overseas and the ones that are made here at home really there's not that huge gap that there used to be I mean it's closing really fast I think here in the states right now. Um, the, the that gap has for Fender at least has basically just disappeared because they allowed it to. Uh, I remember a time when if you bought a made in Mexico Strat, you were going to change pickups out. Like that was just going to happen. Yep. Um, but I think they're they're now putting similar grade parts to what they do in the, the American line. So paying for the made in America stamp. If you yeah. didn't hear that, so yeah, and that's a that's a big thing. Um, is when uh, we how much is that Made in America stamp worth anymore? I mean, in reality, uh, is it worth anything at all? I mean, right. I you can get quality stuff coming from other countries that rivals American prices now. I mean, Strandberg, a lot of their stuff is imported, and it's seventeen hundred to three thousand dollars. It's it's hard for me to justify that kind of cost on an import, yeah. but but for others, I mean, if that's what you want, yeah, that's what you're going to pay. Yeah, it's just um, you know with the with the upcoming um, look at uh, import tariffs and uh, import fees, we may see a price hike sooner. Well, we've already seen price hikes for it. I mean, that's I, I, look at the line six product line. Everything went up a hundred bucks. Yeah. Um, and other brands are starting to follow suit. I know Boss has uh, had a price increase recently, and yeah. um, I I don't think that has any signs of actually stopping. No. Um, now, will it outlast the current administration? Well, you know these companies aren't going to back off the prices. I mean, once the damage is done, the damage is done. Yeah. So maybe it makes them more profitable. Yeah. Maybe that That's translates good. something into good something good for us, but. Until we see it, we don't know. Yeah. Now, I know that um, when you mention uh, Line 6, Line 6 in, in an attempt to make the Helix uh, still seem like a good bargain, uh, the LTs are coming with the free bag. So that Helix bag is coming well, with you the can free. Well, you, uh, I've seen deals with the big one with the bag, too. Yep. Just depends on the retailer. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, you know, the bag is not worth 100 bucks. I'm going to be honest with you. I have it. Exactly. It's, it's just not worth a hundred dollars. Like right. it's a great, it's a good bag, but I mean, like I had it like a week and one of the clips broke. Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And then they're like, Oh, well you need to put an RMA in to get a new one. And I'm like, you can just ship me one because to be honest with you, it's not worth it. And that, right. so I just tied it off and said the hell with them. Yep. yep. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think that, that when it comes to that American made moniker, I think that we've, we've kind of, Seen that it, there's so many things that are not made in America that were, and you know, I, I remember in the 80s people talking about the fact that um, actually, I think it was the late 70s, we were talking about the fact that there were no televisions built in America. And at one time, RCA, um, Sylvania, you know, these guys, GE, they were building televisions right here at home. I had a family um, member who worked for RCA, yeah, but didn't that affect the quality of it? I mean. No. Did did Japanese people building your TVs? Did that make any difference? No. But in did the Korean beginning, people today make any difference? That's right. Oh, and, and that's just it though. In the beginning, people were like, "Oh, it's made it's made overseas, so it's got to be crap," you know. And that's because they were trying to they were trying to keep the jobs in the states, but only with with insults, and that's not really you know. What yeah, I mean, I mean, how many Hondas? from like 25 years ago, 30 years ago, it, really 30 years ago, are still on the road. Yeah, yeah. That's why I drive a Honda. So, you know, we're... It, it, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just saying, we're looking at, we're looking at a change. There is definitely a change. And going along with that, I've got this a little bit later, but that's because they were, these were all stream of thoughts. So Anderson recently had a video where they were talking about the Epiphones. And um, 
they did, you know, they redid where they blindfolded chappers and he had, they had him play um, Epiphones and, and uh, Les Pauls. And they've done it with the newer lines of Epiphones. And here's the thing. The Epiphones are really close now. Um, and so, you know, he was, he was able to find the one that was an Epiphone, but it took a lot longer and a lot more tries. And here's the thing. So one thing that, that um, the captain mentioned, that Lee mentioned, was that uh, he said, I've got some, some free marketing advice for JC at Gibson. And that is this. Just make your headstocks the same. Just like every other brand, you know, Paul Reed Smith, um, Fender, everybody else, the headstocks don't change. I mean, and he said, I understand that if you're going to leave Epiphone on the casinos, because the, the casinos started out as Epiphones. But... right. SGs should look like SGs, and Les Pauls should look like Les Pauls, and, they, and you've got this. You know, it, it, it. I think that it's it's my take. This is my take. When I look at an Epiphone Les Paul, I still see that. I see that. I still see that ugliness of the of the headstock. Now that doesn't mean that I wouldn't buy it, but it does mean that I'm going to take a second look. And um, the, I think that that this me personally, I think that drives some of the chips in market. Um, if all they did was replace the you know replace gibson with epi um i think that you wouldn't have as many of the you know the imports i i, I could be wrong what do you think oh definitely i i um i think that the chips and market is directly driven by the fact that there's so many chinese you know epiphones out there that are just a poor quality um and that people want that look and they want that feel i mean honestly like that's one of the major, and we know this. We've talked about this on the show before. I, I hate the the Epiphone headstock on a Les Paul or or an SG, yeah. but if I could get the same shape with the Epiphone name on it, it wouldn't be as big a deal. Right. Um, I do feel like they have actually kind of like back in shops. The last couple of Epiphones I played, they were um, they were super hot pickups with not a lot of meat to them. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah, it's hard to, um, uh, it, I was playing some acoustics today, so I went to Guitar Center and I played about 30, 40 acoustics today. And I started in like the three hundred to $500 range and wound up in the right. $2,000 to $3,000 range. And the truth is, once I picked up a, a, a acoustic, you know, that was over a grand, and most people should know this, I mean, I, I knew it, um, the sound of an acoustic really is determined by that wood. I mean, that's, that is the wood, the bracing, everything that goes into it, the workmanship is definitely, everything goes into the sound of an acoustic. And you, you can definitely get what you pay for. Yeah. Right. And you, and you start to feel um, that, that vibration in your body and you start to be able to respond to it. And um, I got to tell you, I, so I went from looking at like relatively inexpensive um, guitars to, a Martin. Now, here's the thing, though. I played a um, I played a Martin, and uh, I loved it. Um, and I liked it even better at, at about it, it is normally about a sixteen hundred dollar guitar. It's on sale right now for thirteen hundred, and uh, it really moved me. Um, and it worked with my voice. It was really well balanced as far as the lows and the highs and everything else. It was really nice. Um, and I and I compared it with a lot of, of Taylors. Now, it's not Taylors weren't good because they were awesome. It's just that for my vocal range, the Taylor's kind of stepped on my on my voice, um, and uh, but then I went back to some of the cheaper ones, and I hated. I mean, I hated them at that point. I was like, I can't even buy one of these. I. I That's why I don't have a nice acoustic. <clears throat> yeah. I went looking multiple times. Yep. Yeah, it's hard because you get you've got to pay the money for a good acoustic. I can't. Right, I can't justify over a thousand dollars for a guitar. I'm not going to play every day. Yeah, and that's a so, hard one. So, how many people out there in the in the group are you playing acoustics? And if you're playing them, uh, you know how how much are you playing them every day? That's a tough one. I mean, I know Stephen Conradi had mentioned that he does a lot of acoustic stuff. Um, it's uh, that's a tough place because it's acoustic is. I think acoustic players and electric players are almost different creatures in the way that 
you you know you play and you perform. Oh, certainly. I mean, just the change from uh, wound G to unwound yep. is a big part of it, but also the reliance on you know that instrument to give you the volume rather than using an amplifier. Yep. Um, shaping the tone with just you know just your fingers and everything. Like I know people use effects with acoustic, but frankly, I mean, it's way more intimate than electric guitar yep. in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah, it's more naked if we could use that word. Oh, I definitely feel alien on an acoustic. It it does not use the same like it uses similar techniques, but it's not the same. No, definitely not. And I, um, again, uh, you know, I may be in in the market for an acoustic in a little while, and I'm just like, if I'm if I'm gonna do that, because I'm doing a lot of open night mics, and I'm doing a lot of stuff where it's just a pain in the rear to bring an electric, and it would be nice to bring an acoustic. Um, it's just, you know, uh, um, I, I grew up with a Martin, so there are things about Martins I really like. And I, when I felt that thing, it was literally vibrating in my chest enough that I could, I could feel, you know, the vocals and the, and the way that I was intonating and everything else just, it changes everything about the way you play and sing. Yeah. Martins are, are pretty good for that. And like you said, they have a, they have a very like. There's a notch in there that I think fits real well with a singer. Um, I I feel like a lot of the tailors are more geared towards guys that play by themselves. Yeah. Um, and I know there are people in the group that are probably own me on this because I'm not an acoustic player, frankly. Um, but uh, I just I feel like they're more built around that idea. So. Solo. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that uh, that kind of makes sense. The 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 range of, of um, harmonics that I got from him, and that was something. So my son was with me, and he's nineteen, and he he's not really a guitar. I mean, he plays guitar, but he's not you know like eat, drink, sleep type thing. Not and, like us. Yeah. And here's the thing, though. We played we played um, several guitars, and the first Martin I picked up, and I started playing. He goes, "Oh, Dad, that's got a ring to it." And then when I picked up the other ones, he, he started to say, oh, yeah, that's that's where it is. And then we sat down and I took some into the sound room, you know, and I played, you know, a few of my favorites. And that's where we, we settled in, in that, you know, that midline Martin. Yeah, I think some even some of the inexpensive Martins are, I yeah. mean, they're great guitars. Uh, there was one that I saw that was like 650, yep. no frills, you know. Yep. Um, and it, I mean, I would have bought one. And their electric systems are starting to get pretty good too. And that's yeah. one of the things that Taylor always had a leg up in, but now I, I feel like Martin's caught up. They're buying good systems from aftermarket, that kind of thing. So now if you're just looking for plugged in and you're not doing the other stuff, I'll tell you, you know, a brand that, that surprised it shocked me, literally knocked me off my feet in that store. I've literally had to sit down when I heard it was a Mitchell, believe it or not. Plugged in. Now I'm just telling you, a two hundred and sixty dollar Mitchell actually sounded good because they put a decent Fishman pickup in it. I mean, I'm not saying it was acoustically great. I'm just saying electrically, it sounded all right. Yeah, but but, but Jim, you could take a razor blade and cut up your fingers just as good as that Mitchell. So I I'm just saying, I'm just saying. <laughs> I I was shocked. I was shocked by its playability. And I was shocked by the uh, um, by the pickup system it had in it, especially at that price point. I forget who Sam Ash's house brand is now, but oh, they have a um, house. They have a house brand that actually is doing pretty good stuff right now too. Yeah, they bought not um, not CMG. Who did they buy? Oh, uh, Patriot. No, um, Patriot's one of the brands. Uh, Michael Kelly. Yeah, Michael yep. Kelly. Yep, they bought Michael Kelly. So those of you who like Michael Kelly, so. Yeah, it's a it's a weird thing. So that and that kind of goes along with what I was about to ask you next. So um, I actually uh, weaker versus strong pickups. You and I have been talking about this for a while because you know it it's it's something that really uh, today I really felt because on stage today I um, uh, playing at uh, the um, at the beach I um, I was outdoors right. So it's a little bit easier to tame the tame the beast, so to speak. And I had the strat, and I had the telly, and uh, the strat screamed. I mean, that thing just 
literally screeched. I had to pull back a lot on my volume to get that thing under control when it came to uh, to the rest of the rest of the sound. So the question that um, really comes to mind is, you know, do you want weaker pickups or do you want stronger pickups? And what is the advantage of each? I I think. You hit on it right there where you said, what is the advantage of each? Because I think there are situations where one or the other works great. Um, I've also talked to people who are like, I'll only use quiet pickups. Yeah. And I'm I'm one of these people that just shakes my head when I see that because I'm like, what if you – they're just a bad application. So like I prefer hotter pickups for doing like metal shred type stuff. But I actually like them for blues as well. Yep. But almost everything else, like rock music, uh, I'm fine with a vintage output set of humbuckers or, you know, something like that. Yeah. So, And it really has a lot to do with the amp you're plugging into and how sensitive it is to it um, and how much headroom you want. Like, do you like to feel the amp compress or do you really want to be able to get dynamics? That's a big part of it. Right. Clarity. Um, clarity is the big thing for me. But... I think you can get clarity if you have enough treble output in a hot pickup, too. Yeah. Um, and I find that the clearer high output pickups have a lot less bass. Yeah. So. Definitely. Food for thought. Food for thought. And, and it really, again, that, that goes right along to, like you said, the application. Um, you know, are you playing metal? Are you playing uh, funk? Are you playing jazz? Are you playing blues? And, and within those genres, you've got subgenres. You know? Sure, sure. I don't remember. Like punk, punk music is definitely going to be different than like good old rock and roll, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you're not going to not gonna picture like doing a Sex Pistols thing and then uh, the same, use, you might not use the same guitar. You could, depending on the guitar, um, for like, you know, REO Speedwag. <laughs> it's just going to be something completely different. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're definitely going to look different. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I walked into, uh, that was the other thing. So, you know, last week we talked about, um, I think it was last week, we talked about guitars that are that are um, worn in, pre-worn in. And, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, and so I go in and there's this relic Telecaster when I walk into the, into the store. And it's almost $5,000. It's $4,700. And I look at it and I'm like, I, I still don't get the worn fretboard thing. Just okay. I mean, literally, the fretboard was worn in to the, the divots that were in there. I thought to myself, that would actually not feel comfortable to me. What? I, uh, what? Maple or rosewood? Maple. Yeah. See, no, I can tell you right now. If, if so, you're not playing finished maple fretboards. No, no. And and that and that's your distinct difference. Because what that is is basically like taking the finish off of the maple fretboard. That's, I mean, it's essentially what it is. You might see it as being like divots, but it, you don't feel it that way at all. You feel like an unfinished fretboard, yeah. which is why people want that. Because if you've ever played a finished fretboard, your fingers stick to it like really bad. Then why and, not unfinished fretboard? <laughs> I just said. Well, that's my point is that, like I said originally, you don't have to have one that looks ugly to do that. Yeah. But these people are after that aesthetic. They want a used aesthetic. Yeah. I, I mean, so I get it, it. It's just... There's a market for it. I mean, people yeah. are buying them. Oh, definitely. And people are spending the money. Yeah. That, that guitar will go $4,700 and it will sell. Somebody yeah. will buy it for, you know, the price. Not me. And then, thir and then in 30 years, nobody will care anyway. Yeah, exactly. It's just my, me being jaded right there. No, it's, I don't think somebody will care. In all reality, um, at least in, in my look at it, in 30 years, that guitar already looks 30 years old. Now it looks 60 years old. And it might yeah. not... It. We don't know what a relic's going to look like in 30 years. Most people don't care. I mean, they're buying a relic for today. They're not buying it for 30 years from now. That's not what's in their heads. And I wouldn't either. But I'm just saying that well, Jim, we live in a we live in a society where there are more fifty nine less Pauls than originally produced. Yeah, and people are buying them. Yeah, 
Okay, I'm I'm just saying like it's pretty clear at this point nobody cares whether it's authentic or not. Yeah, yeah. So it's true. Very true. I I couldn't say anything negative to that. Well, I mean, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that that's unfortunately is kind of the mentality of the world. Not everybody. I like. I don't expect everybody to be like me and, and Una over new guitars. Like everything I buy, yep. it's probably been made the last fifteen twenty years. Oh yeah, yeah, me too. So relatively recently. Yeah. Um, I think I've only got one, two guitars that are over twenty years old. Uh, one guitar that's over thirty years old. Right. Right. And so uh, that that's tough. That's a tough market. Um, and at my age, you know, not, not all of us could afford a really nice guitar at that time. So it wasn't really a great guitar back then. Now it's an old crappy guitar instead of a young crappy guitar, (laughs) (laughs) but it's really worn in. I mean, but it's my wear in. And that's the reason that I said that what I said about the, the fretboard, it's like, but that might not be where I want the fretboard worn in. I mean, it almost says... It almost says these are the places you're gonna play. It's almost like I put a fret light. You know, it's it's like it's like a really expensive fret light. Here's the sure. spots you should play. These are the little dots, and you should follow them. <laughs> I'm just saying. I, I, I when I was young and dumb, I used to think like I would buy these really inexpensive guitars. I was like, I'm just gonna play this forever, and then like. It'll be it'll be worth it if I ever make it as a musician. Like it'll be worth it because everybody will be like, "Oh, that's legit." And, and yep. even though it was three hundred dollars when it was new, like, he, you know, it's obviously good because he plays it. Right. Now, being older, more mature, me, I'm like, "What the hell was I thinking?" Well, when you think about it, so we were talking about these earlier. So if you if you think about it, the Mexican Strats were the squires of the day. Well, literally, they were squires of the day, right? So in the right. '90s. Into the early two thousand. I think we only did that for like two years. It was not that long at all. Yeah, no, that was mid nineties. I think ninety seven. Early nineties. Yeah. When they when when they were Squire Mexicans. Yep. That I was, want to say I want to say it was ninety five ninety six, but it might have been earlier than that. And that lasted like a year or two. Yeah. Well, I think it was like ninety one ninety two. But go ahead. Yeah, I don't know. I just know it was the nineties. I want to I want to say it was mid nineties, but I could be wrong. I'm not a big Fender. You know, enthusiast. Yeah. Um, but when you move into, um, it, when you think about it, when I when I first started hunting for my first strat in 2000, 2001, I, I looked for one and uh, the Mexican strats were cheap. Oh, yeah. They were downright cheap. But the, the you know, the saying was, pick up 10 of them, you might like one. And that's the one you'd walk out with. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think it's kind of a... So, even back then, because, like, that was about the time that I was buying and selling all these strats in the beginning. Uh, I think that's kind of a misnomer. I think a lot of people said that, and what they were really talking about was, like, the setup. Yeah. Because, I mean, I played some dog shit fenders that people bought and then had set up, and I was like, oh, okay. I see why you bought it, you know? So, um, and that's a huge part. Like factory setup is a big deal because if you're going to put your stuff at a retail outlet, like guitar center, they're not going to touch it. No, no, there was a time I, um, you know, all of my first guitars before the big market. And that was even before guitar. Well, guitar center was around, but it wasn't, it wasn't huge as big as it is now. Um, you had Mars music and that type of thing. And um, before that, you would walk into a store and they would, you'd pick your guitar and then they would go, okay, we're going to change the strings, we're going to set up the guitar. There's still a shop down here where when you buy a a guitar through them, um, which is why I'm considering getting my next guitar through them, uh, they do lifetime setups. Yeah, yeah. There's still some places around here that do that too. Um, You know, that's another thing. Like, I, I know people who bought guitars from, like, mom and pops, and they didn't get a setup thrown in. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah, really? And then Guitar Center, like, Guitar Center, I've told them, I'm like, I'm not buying it unless you're going to set it up for me. Right. And let me play it before I take it home. Like, there have been a couple guitars where I've, like, actually passed on them because I'm like, 
no, not doing this. Yeah, no. Uh, now I know better. I mean, I could take it home and set it up myself, but. Right. right. But I'm just saying that, that uh, you know, these places, there was a time when they gave you a case. They don't give you a case anymore. You're lucky to get a decent gig bag. Um, yeah. The, uh, they don't give you a, um, a strap. Used to be right. a, th- a strap was thrown in. Don't get a strap anymore. It used to give you strings. Nope, don't throw any strings in anymore. Unless you yep. unless you go to the bottom end. Ernie Ball, uh, Robert Jackson. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, they don't, uh, they don't, I mean, you're lucky if you get them to drop a pick, a pack of picks in for you. Yeah, That's yeah. Just... Well, you know, remember back in the day when you used to get case candy? Yeah. Like, you buy the Fender guitar and you get the Fender strap and all this stuff yeah. in it. Now you're lucky if you get the whammy bar. Like, Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're lucky if they remember to put it in. Yeah. I, when I bought the telly, I upgraded the bag, right? Yeah. So, because I have the deluxe, the deluxe, and I am using air quotes, folks, the deluxe bag for the um, yeah. strap. There's basically it's a step above nylon. No, it isn't even a step above nylon. It is a nylon bag. It is a nylon bag. The only reason it's quote unquote deluxe is because it's got a um, thing in the front where you can put a zipper, you know, stuff in the front. It is literally micrometers thick my, my nylon bag. It has got no. It does it have any padding at all? None, zero. I'm I'm thinking I'm gonna give it back to Guitar Center. It does say Fender on it. I'm gonna give it back to Guitar Center. Tell them to look. I know you guys got poor kids. You give these two. Give them to one. Uh, I'm buying a, a better bag because I got yeah, the I... new padded bag for them. It's more like the mono. Um, you know. I don't know. I mean, with the way you pack things around, you probably should just get a get either a mono dual case or uh, yeah. one of yeah. the. Uh, actually, I really like the Gator case I bought. It's yeah. just as nice as a mono, if not nicer. Yep, I've got a I've got a Gator. I've got a double Gator already. Oh, do you? So, yeah, and so I'll probably just use that. Um, but I carry three guitars to a gig because I carry, oh, that's, yeah, I yeah, carry one with a whammy, one that's tuned standard that I can tone to drop D and then I carry one that's, um, in D flat or E flat. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you can deck one of your trims and yep. get away with it that way too. But yeah, that's, that's always a, that's always a thing. And I like the, um, you know, the, the PRS I use for, um, the whammy stuff too. Which really worked out well today. I got a lot of compliments. A lot of compliments. You get rid. Of, you get rid of that thing. It's got Floyd on it. You don't need a Floyd. You don't need a Floyd. I I have plans. I have plans. I know you have plans. That's I have why plans I'm too. It. I have plans too. I'm going to sell a bunch of stuff. Yep. And I'm going to get. I'm going to probably get another Kiesel. Okay. So yeah. So I'm going to talk about that. So um, what I did last week is I made um, I made real plans like paper, pencil, pen. And I'm building a, a second pedal board for open mics. That way I can use the pedals I have, which are not up here anymore. Flat I'm, board? I'm going to do a flat board, just a flat piece of wood um, with the power supply. Yep. And I'm going to run the, the Fuzz, the um, Paisley, the uh, BD, um, and that's it. Cool. And it'll just cool. be drive pedals. Into the katana, and that's going to be my open mic rig. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Make so it nice and light, easy to carry in and out. I've been contemplating doing a similar sort of like analog board for my Mark V for a while. I don't think I'm actually going to do it. Yeah. Um, I've been playing with the Helix out front. I've been pretty content, um, and uh, I'm definitely getting an attenuator. We, you know, I've talked about it on the show for like six months now gonna happen <laughs> eventually yeah yeah i got um the the thing that i was looking at is that the you know the boss katana is relatively light right and so i can you know pull it in and out plus solid state and, and i'm like you know <clears throat> for open mics i'm dragging my whole rig and uh with this i could just go buy you know, a small bag, put the stuff in a bag, toss it all in there. And yes, I am going to use a one spot, <laughs> throw it in there because I don't care. It's open mic stuff. 
it's not all that stuff's modern pedal designs anyway. You don't you shouldn't have a problem with using a one spot. Yeah, exactly. So that's why I'm that's why I'm going that way. So we'll we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um There was something I was gonna ask. I'm not cutting out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm oh, gonna right. I'm gonna um, actually go back and edit all those by the way. So Oh good good, good luck with that. Yeah. Um well, I just look for look, dead spots. How did you so you have your you have your fenders now. Yep. Like how's the transition been for you? Because you, you're typically a Gibson, you know, like PRS guy. Yeah, so well it it I think the biggest thing is that, that finding fenders with a um now I know the elites come with a compound um, radius um, but finding them with a 12 inch radius has really helped me considerably in that transition um, that's that was the big that was the big thing that and the um, the backs of the necks it, and yes Gibson finishes their necks PRS finishes their necks for some reason when Fender finishes the back of a neck it becomes a gooey mess in your hand I mean it just glues to your fingers oh I've I've had similar problems with Epiphones, but not really Gibsons. And I think it's just the type of nitro they use. Yep. It's not as elastic. Um, I, the urethane that Fender uses is just, I feel like PRS is using a, uh, like a smoother lacquer. Yep. Like, I don't know. I, I, that's the best way I can think of describe it. They have, a, they definitely have their own formulation and it's yeah. different yeah. than the others. So they're both Rojas compliant. <laughs> well, no, I mean PRS is too. I mean, there yeah, has to be stuff. It's... Yep. Right. And I, I find that with the with these fenders, with the deluxes, that um, I'm having a really easy movement, um, and it, and it has definitely convinced me that if I go to an American one, it's going to have to be a, an elite. Have mm -hmm, to be. Mm -hmm. Um. Well. Maybe maybe we'll have to change that at Gearfest. We'll, we'll have to show you some things and yeah, yeah, convince you. Try to convince, convince me you. that that I need a um, uh, what do you call it? There's, I mean, let's uh, face it, that the um, if I'm going to spend the money, um, the Elite Series has got the you know, it's got I mean, the the advantage. Well, you know, this is going to sound really sacrilegious to um, all of our listeners. Yeah. But like, you know, the old joke is like, how many guitars is too many? And it's like, one more. One more. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah. One um, more. Well, the, I, I, I will know I need another seven string. Yep. Like, I have the features in my head that I need, yep. but I just don't have any desire to have any other guitars right now. Yep. The only, uh, the only thing I have uh, desire to do is to change the... Um, the tuners on the Squire. That's it. Yeah. That yeah. is it. I probably will do that the next um, month or two. Um, yeah. Just get a set of lock, a set of Fender locking tuners and throw them on there. Only because I, and not because folks, I think, oh yeah, the locking tuners are better than the blah, blah, blah. I just, I may as well, if I've got to buy new ones, get locking tuners. Yeah. I mean, for the difference in price, you're talking 20 bucks. Yeah, exactly. And and so much better machining. It's, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Tuning stuff. Well, I mean, you can get so you can get some crazy good gear ratios going without locking, but yep. I mean, why would you? Right. And then um, the other thing is that the next thing I'll do to it, and that would probably be before the end of the year, is just get a new neck. Sure. Sure. Well, I mean that. So you're going to get a warm-off neck? Yeah, think? I'd get a warm-off or Mighty Might or something like that, yeah. Yeah, just don't go overboard. I mean, leave it at Telly. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no. Because I know, dude, I know we talked about it. You were like, at one point we were pricing out, like, what? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> I just, you were you were just overkilling it, like, super hard. Oh, yeah, yeah. You were, like, getting all these crazy woods and the I'm neck, like why do you the, even know how that's going to sound the, the neck would sound the neck would make that guitar like <laughs> worth 10 times the amount of money that I spent I spent $140 on a guitar I'm not putting I'm not putting yeah, a, yeah, it's like a $900 $900 neck on there. Yeah. 
and and, and the funny thing it's still is, still gonna be worth one hundred forty dollars. He chose some exotic wood, so the neck is just like hitting the floor. Yep, yep. No, I'm uh, I'm looking for a basic telly neck, but I would like to get um, you know a, a twelve inch radius. Put a basic telly neck on it, and then you know. Honestly, I don't even know what the price tag is yep. on that. I I might even look to see if you know I can find somebody's got a broken Telecaster. Go, hey. I mean, like 250, 300 bucks usually. They're not they're not that expensive for for a warm off neck, by the way. No, and they're and they uh, you can get them with compound radius, double yeah. action truss rod, like they're high quality pieces. I mean, that's where I would go. I don't they think I would have... buy a used neck for because, like, to be honest with you, you're gonna you're gonna have a real tough time finding a used telly neck that has all the pieces you want. Because I don't think anybody actually realizes until they go on the hunt for one, like how many different necks they actually manufacture. Oh yeah, when I when I was looking for a neck or um a, yeah a neck type thing earlier today, I was at yeah. Sweetwater right, and uh, I saw this uh, thin line neck, mm-hmm. and uh, let's see, I'm looking up the price right now. I looked at. Um, and it was, let's see, where's my Sweetwater link? Here it is. We're supposed to do, we're supposed to do with you. I know. Just no research, nothing. I did. I did. It, okay. 199.98. I get a yeah. bare, bare bone neck. 199.98. Fender Classic Series 72 Telecaster thin line replacement neck. 200 bucks. You know what you'd like? Go to warm off and get a get a tele conversion neck for uh, less Paul scale. No, oh. <laughs> see now you're going nuts. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, this is an unfinished neck, and it's I'll bolt it right on there. Now the question I have for people who are Fender fanatics: Can I do that to a Squire? Can I put it? A... Un- yes, you can. Okay. But unfinished, you're going to have some issues there. Because the climate where you live, so humid. Yeah. You can't do unfinished. You're going to have to treat that wood with, with something. And I would recommend like tongue oil or something like that. Yeah. Well, it so, says maple fretboard. Maybe it's not. Uh, maybe it's just. Uh, yeah, but I'd have to. No, this is definitely unfinished. I'd have to tongue oil it. There's yeah. No you have to do something. You have to do something. Because if you don't like it, it's going to. You're. It's going to split. Yeah. I'm looking at it right now. It's definitely unfinished. Um, yeah. I'd have to put some tongue oil on it. And. And I would definitely have to, at least it's, it is a Fender branded neck though. Um, it's just funny that they have that neck there. Like they don't typically buy necks. So I wonder if a guitar came and broke and they had to, they took their hand Oh no, they, no. So if you're, if you're a Fender dealer, you carry Fender replacement parts oh, really? and necks are just standard replacement parts. There was a time where you had to turn in your neck to get another neck because they didn't want people assembling guitars out of their parts. Oh yeah, yeah. They don't do that anymore. Um, Janelle does, but they don't. And they, that's another weird thing because Janelle's neck neck joint is different. There's no parts congruity. Really? Yeah, not even the pickguards, and that's not just because of the bridge route. Um, I can't like the pickups that I put in there from from Nick. I had to widen the holes. Really? On the pickguard. Yeah, I just had to rub a little bit of sandpaper around the inside to get them to fit. That's quite. That's crazy. Yeah. So speaking of that, speaking of the pickups and the guitars and all that stuff, so I put up a video, folks, of um, example. Yeah, an example video of what you do. You you can email us. You don't have to post it to the. Yeah, to if the you group. don't want anybody to see it, you can email it to us. You can email us a link to your video if it's not on like YouTube or whatever. Yeah. Or you can post it in the group. So. So whatever you want to, to do. I'll put a post up with the actual rules tomorrow if I can remember to do so. So if people want to uh, do that, um, we, we're we looking for videos. Tell us tell us why. Tell us why your dog needs one. Tell us why your fish needs some new new pickups. I think we got one. I think, I think a lot of people are just not real excited about strap pickups right now. Yeah. Which, which is part of this. Um, so, but right now it's anybody's game because we haven't really received much support on this yet. So if you, if you're thinking about it, 
throw your hat in the ring because you might you might win this other pickup. So yeah, and this I mean, like I said, even if you don't need them, and you're thinking, oh well, these would be nice for, you know, whoever. You know what? These are these are one of those items if you put in your parts bin, like five years from now when you have a strat, like you'll have them, and and I can't stress it enough. Like they'll be really good even then. Yeah, exactly. So. Exactly. So our next. Um, I'm, I'm amazed I haven't had to run to the bathroom. I know. He's <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get for having sushi overseas. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it's like I had salmon last night. It might as well be sushi. Um, so, yeah, for, for the folks who don't know, uh, David is over there and. I'm at the Gaylord Hotel in uh, in it actually it's the Gaylord Texan. I've stayed there. You have you? Yeah. When? Uh, geez, a lot in t- between 2003 and 2009, 10. I probably yeah. stayed there a hundred times. And you didn't well, see the YouTube or nothing? Maybe seventy or eighty. Yeah, yeah. I recognize it now. Yeah, so that's where I'm at. I'm at the Gaylord Texan, and I just read all the rooms and stuff. So it's. Really nice here. But. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I like that. I like that hotel a lot. Yeah, it's it's been fun. I'm I'm working my butt off. So. Yeah. Yeah. That, as a matter of fact, uh, I got to meet some uh, pretty famous people, which is, which comes to one of my other things. Uh, while I was there, I was in the. Um, I had to work doing a server up um, install. Uh, there's a Verizon facility out there in that area over by DFW. It's actually on DFW. So um, I was staying at the Gaylord because my, my boss was like, well, stay somewhere nice. You're going to be stuck there, you know, for two weeks. Stay, stay at the Gaylord. Yeah. So she put me up in the Gaylord. And from then on, that's where I stayed. And uh, so I'm in the, I'm all alone. Um, and to put it in perspective, it was like the first year that the new stadium was put in Arlington for the Cowboys. Okay, okay. And it was football season. So I'm all alone. I ordered a pizza and I went down and picked it up and, and went into the, you know, my whole lonely self, went into the the, um, the elevator, got in the elevator, and these drunk guys come in there and they're all laughing and they're all huge <laughs> talking. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm in there and they're like, What are you doing tomorrow? And I said, oh, I'm just hanging out. Oh, you're hanging out with us. Come on. Meet us in the, you know, meet us in the lobby, blah, blah, blah. and I wound up at a at a Dallas um, game the next day. <laughs> yeah, well, that worked out. <laughs> it was it was really nice. I wound up and like you look cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come hang out with us. And it was it was um uh, what do you call it? box seating? And we were in a um you know up in a like a whatever you call those those boxes up in the sky box. Sky yeah, box. Sky box. Thank you. I wanted to say skyline for some reason. A sky box. <clears throat> I'd rather be in the Skyline GTR myself. Yeah, they brought they brought beer in. And we, it didn't matter. We didn't have to pay. They just signed for everything, and it was awesome. It was awesome. Nitrogen tires. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that one of my favorite things to do, and that, that goes along with what I was talking about. So, we we go to concerts. You and I were talking about this the other day. You go to concerts, and how often do you see nothing but cell phones stuck in the air? Or iPads. This is really killing. I get the cell phone thing, but geez, I'm crow. The next thing you know, somebody's going to bring in their desktop and their, <laughs> their whole video equipment. I mean, uh, you're, you're blocking the view as it is with your cell phone stuck over your head. No, now I'm going to hold up an iPad. Now like, I'm going to hold up an iPad like this. It's going to be. I'm going to try not to swear during this segment. I'm going to work really hard at it. Yep. So I believe me. You're talking about iPads in a concert and. I, my wife and I have yelled at people for doing that stuff because it's like, seriously, you're, you're destroying the environment for everybody else. It's as bad as when you go to a concert and people won't sit down. They want to stand. Yeah, they want to stand up. And I've had that happen at lawn. I've had that happen at lawn shows and it's terrible. Oh, yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. I... You know, you get there, and it's like I, I'm trying to enjoy myself, and no, I can't because there's there's people, you know, there there's the person that brings the cowboy hat, you know. Yep, the ten gallon hat. 
or the sombrero. <laughs> the sombrero, yeah. <laughs> it's like four other people underneath the hat with him, you know. <laughs> I've seen him bring umbrellas. Like that's another one that I'm like, what? Why? I know, right? It's it's silly. You know, it's silly. We do we do the poor man's raincoat. I'll bring a garbage bag, and cut a hole for my face, you know, and that's the only thing you can see. <laughs> I mean, I could be under the bridge after the show. You don't know. Well, yeah, exactly. It's uh, to me, <clears throat> it's all about um, uh, it's all about enjoying yourself. You know what I mean? Having a good time, um, and. Unfortunately, for some people, having a good time is not being there and not really – You're. it's like – I get it. You want a picture and I get it. You want a little video. But some people, they, they don't stop every song. Yeah. Every... Well, and it has to do with I think like certain bands attract a group of people who are like, I just want to say I was at the show. Yep. Um. One of my favorite bands is, of course, Genesis. Now, everybody thinks Genesis. Oh, Phil Collins, you know, in the late later years and all that. It's like, look, no, I'm talking about Peter Gabriel dressing up like a freak on stage, Genesis. And um, in those early days, that band was a bunch of people who were just really into music. And if you go to, like, that kind of show where they're, you've got a cover band doing that, nobody's going to be whipping out their phone. Right. But like, it's you don't go to you don't go to be there. You know what I mean. And when people go that go to be there, that's when it gets stupid, and people act a fool. Um, I've seen that. Like, so we went to see Brad Paisley, and there were everybody was acting a fool. And it's like, well, that's because all the people that are here don't really like the music. They're just here to say I went to see Brad Paisley tonight. Um, so, for what it's worth. Yeah, and that's I mean. I don't know what you can say to that except uh, it's um, what's the word? I, I, I see it as unfortunate because I, I see it as losing touch. We are we are getting to a point, um, and this might sound political, but we're getting to a point where we're disassociated even when we're in the room. You know what I mean? Sure, sure. I mean, I was in a conference today doing you know the actual labor work that drives the conference. And it's really funny because even with the other people that are around me, like I'm seeing some of them on cell phone. Like I mean, the other staff members, they're on cell phone. We have members right here in front of us. We need to help these people get off your phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there was a, there's a guy named Damien Keys, and he's like a um, in UK. He does these videos for folks in the UK who have originals and cover bands and he's like in a management company he was talking about the fact that um these musicians would be in a meeting to, and stop to check their tinder profile because they got a tinder name i kid you not that is how disassociated we are we think that our cell phone is more important than the people we're standing next to cell phones were for okay i need an emergency you know my my kids, my wife, I need it for 911 and broke down outside of the road. My husband, my, my boyfriend, my girlfriend. Now it's, it's, oh, well, I got to, I got to respond to my cell phone because it went off every single time, all the time, everywhere. Yeah. I'm, I mean, like, so me, I've had problems at work meetings where I whip it out and like, you know, people just say that's terrible sexual harassment. Um, <laughs> anyway. No, I I pull out my cell phone to check email or whatever, and right. it's it becomes a problem. So now we're like, and Jim, I don't know if you're aware of this. There have been certain musicians and and um, performers who are like, you got to put your cell phone in a bag when you go into the venue. You should. And you can't, and and it locks, and like you can't take it out until the venue's or until the thing's over. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get yeah. it. I get both sides of it. I just don't get the fact that. Like I'm going to see Bonamassa in August, and I've never seen him before. I, I haven't even really listened to his music. Jim, Jim, I, we're, we're totally forgetting about. Without cell phones at venues, we never would have seen Lenny Kravitz. Beep. <laughs> it's, it's just, now I gotta blank that out. <laughs> Beep. 
<laughs> I'm just making myself a little a little no, tone no, that just... I can bring back over. Beep. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, sorry. His beep, beep. Yeah, his his beep. Beep. So the thing is that that we we um and that's true. I I don't think we needed to see that, but it's true. I, <clears throat> But for me, I mean, I'm going to see Bottom Awesome for the first time. So, yeah, I'll take a selfie and, you know, I'm going to, you know, but I'm not going to videotape the whole thing. I want to I want to experience it. This will be my first time experiencing his music. And, you know, when I grew up, we heard these bands on the radio, but seeing them live for the first time it was this incredible thing. And you could go back and you could tell your friends. And the only thing you had was your stick and tub, you know, your stick and tub, your ticket stub as proof that you went. That was your that was your proof. You had a and and I I have this scrapbook that's got all these ticket stubs in it, and it's like, you know, and some of them I put record cover album covers in, and then I would put the ticket stub underneath. But now it's like I got to have a Facebook post, and I got to have an Instagram post, and I got to yeah. have a Snapchat post, and I got to. Can you believe there was a time in history where people actually went to see music live before they heard it any other way? But I, this is the thing that that people kind of that that some folks that are coming up, they're like, I can't believe you. It's not that long ago. It's just not well, that long ago that cell phones weren't at every concert. We didn't have a, recordings of music. Until the latter part of the, of the eighteen hundreds, right? And you don't have you didn't have cell phones that could record decent video until in the two thousand tens. Yeah. So I mean, my, but but I think the point we're trying to make here is the same thing, which is that like music is something to be experienced, and I think right. each generation finds their own unique way to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that the the root element should remain the same, and I I honestly see. Like taking away that root element. Yeah. Um, so the root of music is, of course, it's a live performance art, right? And so, fine, I can get down with the studio thing. Like, I understand that. That's that's a product of the 20th century for sure. But like, as you as you journey into that, like, now we're getting to the point where we're not even creating music in a live environment at all. We're doing it on a laptop, you know. So. Yeah, and it, and it loses. Um, there, there's a creativity lost. And we so for our guitarist listeners, obviously, like what I'm really trying to talk about here is the fact that like we need to remain in touch with that too, and not get distracted by the idea that like, well, we could put this track together in the studio, mm -hmm. you know, and just as needed. Yeah, it's you know what I mean. Like, it just sterilize it yeah um as a matter of fact rick beato had a uh video this week where he was talking about all we all everything being snapped to grids and you know and how you could literally copy paste parts and you could you could copy paste parts in and out of each other and mm -hmm. because they were snapped to a grid you could rebuild the song like legos in 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 logic pro now they have they have these features for like automatically detecting tempo for a given yep. section yep. and it allows you to do just that like super easy. Yep. yep. That's what he was using. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Pete Thorne was talking about how that is, is stealing from that, that feeling because he was talking about um, uh, how it takes away from your risk, your response to the rest of the band and to whether it's the bass player, the other guitar player, whatever, it loses a, a, that natural, uh, organic feel that everybody talks about. You know, it's funny. We hear all these guitar players. They're worried about, I got to have my tube tone. Got to have this guitar. Got to have this wood. Got to have this thing. And then I'm going to plug it into a computer and I'm going to snap grid it and I'm going to, you know, talk yeah. correct it. I'm going to time align, time align it and I'm going to cut off my notes early and I'm going to set it up so that, you know, I'm seriously gated. And... Yep, and I'm going to extend this note this long and I'm going to yeah. do it. And it's the exact opposite of everything you're going after. In my, I mean, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Well, I just miss my, like, dirty music, you know what I mean? Like, dirty rock and roll where it's like people just didn't really give a crap about any of that. Yeah, you I mean, here's, 
listen to the Misfits records. Like people love those records, and they, I mean, those guys cannot play. Like they're not good musicians, and maybe they are now. I don't know, but like that was not the point, no. you know. Well, so. listen to Nirvana. I mean, and I, you know, you and I are not Nirvana fans, but the people who were fans of Nirvana, that was part of it. He didn't know how to mute a string. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've talked about like Kiss, for example. Like, yeah. what everyone knows, Kiss has a legion of fans, but right. Ace Freely was not a great guitar player. Like, he was great in a different, in a certain way. You know what I mean? Right. And it was more about the attitude and and the execution than it was like what he was actually doing. Exactly. He was again that guy who did not mute his strings that much. Page. <laughs> Page, come on. Look at those early Zeppelin recordings and listen to I mean, this is a guy who was a studio guy, so he, he knew was a mad he was a mad genius because there's he definitely was. some like these threads of like yeah, okay, this this sounds like it's really off, but he was but doing it on not, purpose. Right. Yeah. And that's that's the mad genius of Page. Like you look at somebody like uh like Kurt Cobain and that's just it was just lack of ability. Yep. Um and Page is like not lack of ability, but like making a conscious artistic decision to sound that way. That's correct. To allow a string to ring out when he let go or to hit a string that you wouldn't necessarily want to be open during a certain, you know, uh, chord or progression. Um, what drives me crazy about him is when you listen to like on the How the West was one, there's a version of um, Heart, the Heartbreaker solo. I've got it. And it is identical to the record i yep. mean how do you how do you do that again that that proves the mad genius because yeah. it is if it wasn't on purpose you couldn't do it twice yeah and it's very very close i mean it's not i don't want to say it's 100 percent accurate but it's like he retraced the same ideas so closely that that the audience would never know no no well it's like gilmore i mean it, that guy i don't know how he does it. he can and he was known for, he would go in and he would play like three or four solos. And then back then with tape, he would cop and ch chop and chase and, and then create a solo. But then play that solo. Yeah. And somehow with all the chopped up, taped together pieces of tape that were running, duplicate that solo <laughs> uh, a second time. I mean, Zappa had libraries of people who would just come to his house and like play some stuff, like some random chords and whatever. And then he would just keep it in the library. And then later on, he would just like throw it on a record, and match a bunch of stuff up together. And I mean, when he was doing that, that was tape. But like I want... today, a sample library, you could do right. that digitally all day long. But yeah. doing that with tape is something else. And and knowing how to find it, where to find it. It's yeah, not like yeah. you can do a search engine. But here's the thing, that because some people will say, well, you're talking about cut and paste and tape, and then you were just putting down um, the the um, part where people are using this. It's a completely different thing. You're not time aligning tape. You can't. Right. You're not time aligning a pad. <laughs> As a matter of fact, some of the greatest songs that I can think of have boo-boos in them. Oh, they yeah. They outright boo-boos. Eruption. It's full of them. Um, so is uh, Bohemian... Well, not the whole song, but Bohemian yeah. Rhapsody has a very conspicuous error in there. Yes. And and you can hear it on there, and, it, and like you expect it to be replicated live. That's how synonymous it is with the song. Yep. So. yep. Uh, you know, I, I, there's a couple of my favorite ACDC records. You can hear people talking on the tape. They screwed up and got the sound of the guys in yeah. the in this room, the, the control room, talking. But because it was tape... The, we, yeah, go ahead. The original Voodoo Child, like, not yep. Voodoo Child Slight Return, but right. the actual, like, blues vamp that's on that record, uh, that's on uh, Jimi Hendrix's um, Electric Ladyland. If you listen to that, you can hear, like, through a good set of headphones, and it's played at a reasonable volume, you can actually hear what the people are saying in the background, and it's <laughs> really quite funny. Because there's like there's a note at the end where he's like, "Man, turn that turn that guitar down!" Like somebody, <laughs> somebody in the audience is like, "Oh my god!" Like turn it down. Oh yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. Yep, I I've heard lyrical um, mistakes. I've heard guitar mistakes. I've heard drum mistakes. I've heard dropped sticks 
on the yep. drums. You can hear it go click, 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 click. The creaky bass drum of John Bottom. Yep, yep. Yeah, the kick. Um, yeah. It's just that that thing that you got. I mean, there was a time when, like, with a kick drum, every drummer I knew carried a pillow to a gig because you stuck a pillow in your yeah. drum. To... Yeah, I still know people who do that. Yeah. Um, and it's – there's nothing wrong with it because that's a certain sound. Like, yep. you're not going to be able to get the sound of when the levee breaks without muting your drums properly. Yep. Yep. And when that's the record, then that's actually the song where you can hear that creaky bass pedal. Yep. That one and Since I've Been Loving You. Those oh, yeah. two songs specifically, like, if that bass pedal was not... Uh, if it was properly oiled, yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, it, that song would be destroyed. Well, think about um, uh, the stuff that Keith Moon did. I mean, if you're a Who fan, and I am a Who fan. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I like mean, him speaking in and singing on the mics when nobody was paying attention. Yep. Like, <laughs> yeah. Hey, he was, uh, he was definitely, he was another, um, unfortunately, we lost him too, way too young, but uh, just a genius. And and a mad genius at that when it came to yeah, the stuff. Yeah, uh, I think madness was a big part that of that. That was a big part. Well, I mean, early Pink Floyd, uh, you listen to some of the stuff that they're doing. Um, you'd, you'd, you're listening to uh, the chord changes, and you'd say, oh, they're going to go to this. They didn't go to that. They went to something completely different. And that was... Yeah, the, right. Yeah, they, but well, the only difference between Sid Barrett and... Um, and uh, uh, Keith Moon was that Keith Moon fought the original drummer to become the, the drummer for the Who, whereas yep. Sid, Barrett, Sid Barrett just kind of did it. But. Yeah, he was just <laughs> he was incredible. Anyway, yeah, so we're we're hitting our hour mark. We're a little yeah. actually probably a little bit over at this point. I want to go ahead and call it because I got to get up early in the morning. Uh, I'm you know, well, I've got to watch Game of Thrones. You got a lot of you got a lot of editing to do. Too, Jim. I do, and I got to watch Game of Thrones. Yeah, I what time, what time does this post? Uh, you just post it tomorrow, any time in the evening. Okay. Yeah, I'll, so. I'll edit it in the morning and post it up. All right. So, uh, win those pickups. Yes. Uh, look in the group for details on it. I'll post it before the show airs, probably. And um, I have been David. I have been Jim. And, and tonight we, we were been. the practical guitarists. That's right. And we heard you.